Noah, I got my gear on trying to support the squad. The Sixers aren't doing the greatest at the moment, but the Phillies have infected the city with the Phillies fighting fever, however you want to describe it. Uh, man, that Bryce Harper home run, uh, that, that's that's like probably top five, top three all time in, in Philly sports uh, significant plays. I, I was at my friend's house jumping up and down. It, it was unbelievable. What, what about you? Where were you when the when the home run happened in the eighth inning? Yeah, so I'll say first, I was there when Harper hit the uh, walk-off grand slam against the Cubs, and it was hard for me to Ooh. imagine a more dramatic, just awesome moment than that. And of course, he has easily exceeded that. Uh, so now that I have that background, brutally honest, I think I was probably sleeping through this one. Um, I think the Sixers- <laughs> That Sixers, wasn't you up on the on the street pole? Come not on. exactly, no. That wasn't um, you? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was not me up there, but NBA season has some odd rhythms and uh, sleep can be erratic, so I believe I was not conscious for this, but of course I have seen it replayed many times and enjoyed uh, that great moment by Bryce Harper coming and throwing in the clutch, but I was not viewing it live in complete training. We, we can't we can't let that ride. You, you you weren't sleeping, you were swimming with sharks. You you were you were climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, like you were doing something, not sleeping, but my God, fully dedicated to the season. Start college, build skills, and complete your degree with Wilmington University. 100% online options and affordable tuition makes WilmU work for you. Learn more at wilmu.edu. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. WilmU works. Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, Ben Barry. You know the principles, but... Before we get to the minutia of the Sixers situation, a round of applause. Their final first victory of the season, uh, last loss of the week, uh, hopefully, as they're taking on the Raptors twice Wednesday and then Friday, I believe. So uh, hopefully, Noah, these guys have gotten things together. 120-106, they beat the Indiana Pacers, a team they should beat. Um, but finally, it looked like the effort was there. They were matching the intensity of their opponent. They weren't going through the motions. Uh, before we get into the minutia, like I said, well, how should fans feel about this 0-3 start? Should it be something that they just stick in the back of their mind, they chalk it up to growing pains and the team trying to gel, or is it something bigger than that? Well, how do you think fans should feel about that 0-3 start? Yeah, well, firstly, when you asked for the round of applause, my assumption was that would be Philadelphia Phillies related, a team that... <laughs> you know, has actually merited quite a good deal of applause right. over the last week. The Sixers, not so much. At the lost Saturday to the Spurs, there were great cheers in the fourth quarter when they showed a Phillies update on the big screen in the fourth quarter. But, of course, the Sixers were booed at the end of that game, which they dropped to the Spurs. Yeah, I think the big picture here is, in all likelihood, it's a little bit of both the broad categories that you reference. I do think it's it's fair to call the effort substandard over the first three games. And we've heard a bunch of players just say the communication needs to be much better. And looking back at that Spurs game, it was worse than it felt in person in terms of so many possessions with defensive breakdowns and guys not being on the same page and just not executing the basics, whether that's this guy's a shooter, you need to close out to him, whether that's getting back on defense, all five guys, whether that's properly executing a switch, just a lot of issues. And if you have that many things that are going wrong, uh, it's hard to win games in the NBA. But I, I think to me, last night's a reminder that talent will should often allow the Sixers to win despite all of that. They've got James Harden, who outside of the poor shooting night against the Spurs has begun this year really well. And I think is still very encouraging just how well Harden uh, has played thus far. Gave the Sixers 29, 11 and nine last night, bunch of big buckets in the fourth quarter where things started to get a little shaky. So a couple of all-stars, Tyrese Maxey, some two-way players on your bench, and you still should be able to win. 
and the Sixers at least can say that they have done that now. But yeah, this uh, has been a rough start for the team. And I think there's got to be a little sigh of relief that they finally are not winless anymore. And I love that Joel Embiid is deciding to score the ball inside more. And I think that was a takeaway, uh, something I noticed from the Pacers game, because it just, uh, man, there's so many jumpers kind of gets on my nerves. But I, I understand the inside out game is part of who he is. But I would appreciate if he imposed his will more, so to speak, in that regard. But staying with the 30,000 foot view, and you made a great point about Harton, but Doc Rivers came out and said blatantly we're not ready yet um what do you what does he mean by that and how can that just be a blanket statement that the coach who's supposed to be getting them ready and preparing the team admits that after these losses when the rhetoric was so much different and the uh you know words from the team and the players were so much different leading up to the season and leading up to those losses but Then they suffer the losses, and it's like, well, we're just not good enough. Right. I didn't read that at all as an excuse. I read that as we haven't played to the standard that is necessary to win in the NBA yet. I think inevitably you start the season 0-3 with after all these high expectations, and you probably can't say anything that people are going to like after the game. To me, I have noticed that – he, he seems a little more inclined to nip things in the bud in games, and there doesn't seem to be a huge level of trust in his players that they can figure things out on their own. And I understand that to a large extent. Um, yeah, I asked about it kind of last night before the game, and the answer from Doc Rivers, as it often is, was a little politician-y, but he admitted against the Spurs there were just way too many self-inflicted defensive errors and he said depending on the circumstances of the game sometimes it is appropriate to you know call a timeout and try to figure figure those out as they occur but yeah you you would hope with this Sixers team so many veterans that you think should be able to execute the fundamentals that they wouldn't have started out this way and that there wouldn't have been so much immediate pressure on the head coach and the stars and Uh, these broad, fair questions about whether this team is really as good as everyone thought they would be. And I think we'll learn a lot more here as they hit the road, four games coming up, two against the Toronto Raptors. And if these games go well, uh, I think you buy a lot more into the notion that, okay, they're integrating new guys. They had one or two of the stinkers that occur over an 82-game season, and now they're back on track. But doesn't look like wins are going to come uh, too easily based on what we've seen thus far. And when you say everyone that thought they would be good, I mean, everyone, I mean, you couldn't have did a podcast, a, you listened to a podcast, you know, read a story or anything where the Sixers weren't among those five or six upper echelon teams that people experts were projecting to be in the Eastern conference finals and the NBA championship. Some thinking they could win the whole daggone thing. So it, this is a definitely a, a, a wild start. Um, we haven't had a podcast here since games two, three, and now four last night. Um, so it, it's 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 difficult to absorb all of this information and not kind of regurgitate it in a way where you compartmentalize it and try to like address you know topic by topic. But so let's move on to James Harden. Like like you mentioned, he has looked great. Um, And despite the poor shooting game against the Spurs, just his the way he's he's been moving on a basketball court, the way he's had the ball on the string, um, of course, he kind of redeemed himself from that Marcus Smart, you know, shimmy and and move last night um, by knocking the young kid Matherin down and hitting the three and making it. But just the way he's been moving, man, and the, the way the ball has been on his hands, it just it definitely looks a bit like the throwback Harden. Um, I, I get annoyed that I feel like there's a lot of standing around that happens when he's doing that, but um, it hasn't come back to hurt the Sixers that much as of yet. We'll see how it incorporates itself throughout the season. But just the way he's been moving, the way the jump shot has looked, you, you can tell that he's healthier 
uh, in better shape, like we've noticed. But the difference between you know what he was last year and what he is now is is really noticeable. Yeah, move, movement is what stands out after after the big game he had against the Bucks. He was asked about just the physical strength he showed and had a little back and forth. And then ultimately he said, just look, I can move now. Just very bluntly with the strong implication that that wasn't really the case last year. And more candid, of course, now about how in his mind, the hamstring issues last season significantly hampered him and made him a worse player. And you can see there is more explosiveness, more shiftiness, and sharper deceleration, too, I think has been really noticeable and has also been a big asset with this mid-range game that he's shown an increased willingness to turn to. So, And the deceleration, you mean like his change of pace? Yeah, and just quickly stopping and starting. Yeah. Um, the step back, of course, is where it's prominent, but in some of those times, too, where he uses a little forearm to create contact and then boom, yeah. stop, and the jumper goes up really quick. Yeah. yeah, just um, some of those subtleties that make James Harden who he is. Uh, that we didn't really yeah. see him willing to go in the bag like that last year. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think last year, of course, we're dealing with a small sample, but comparatively we're seeing fewer instances where the main option is uh, I didn't really create too much separation and I'm going to try to draw a foul. seems like he is confident in the mid-range. And of course, Sam Cassell is an expert in that area. Harden called him a mentor and they do have a close relationship, worked closely together this summer. And it does appear that's paying dividends. Again, percentage wise, there's going to be a dip inevitably, but the fact that he wants to be a more unpredictable offensive player and does seem quite capable of both getting off and making shots at all three levels, that's a big deal for the Sixers in the big picture. Um, But of course, every night it's not going to be perfect. You know, four for 18, a guy does that and it's going to hurt your chances of winning the game. But the Sixers, I think, will continue to trust in James Harden as their lead ball handler. They'll continue to tolerate some of those possessions where he's pounding the rock late in the shot clock. But I think last night you saw there was an emphasis on ball movement and it not all being about hard and centric possessions. Multiple guys said the shoot around was all about that, just moving the ball up the court as fast as you could. And then once you got the offense flowing, just being willing to share the rock. Uh, And I think that approach mixed with some possessions that are just all about James Harden is probably the ideal one for the Sixers. I do think the team overall needs to play faster. It makes sense that they were focusing on that. They were last in the league in pace heading into last night's game. Uh, But James Harden in the half court or in transition, I think when he's uh, your main guy, you you should feel pretty good about it based on what we've seen uh, thus far. Yeah, Doc Rivers saying after the game that they worked on and practiced shoot around of getting the ball across half court uh, with 20 seconds on the clock, like that, that is pushing the rock. Um, he said it didn't quite meet that, but the pace was much better as uh, everyone saw because uh, even Harden, um, I think at least two or th- at least three times, at least two times, possibly a third time, he had that, you know, throw ahead pass to Tobias Harris with his man on his back in the post that was like well over half court into the paint. So, um, and that worked successfully a few times, but just the mentality of getting it up the court. But you said um, that uh, Harden has been moving well. Contrarily, Joel Embiid isn't quite there yet, and we learned that he uh, suffered plantar fasciitis uh, in the off season, which um, for a big man who has you know had foot issues is not something you want to hear. Um, if you've ever had plantar, you know the pain that comes with it. Um, particularly when you wake up in the morning and kind of get your feet out of the bed and onto the floor, but um, not something that can't be, you know, remedied or fixed. And hopefully MB can play with, you know, that ailment and work his way back into shape and be, you know, what, what we expect of him. Because, you know, I think part of him relying on the jump shot as much and not going into the paint probably centers around, 
that physical conditioning not being quite where it needs to be and ala adel nabi pointed out in a broadcast which is a simple concept to understand is it's much easier you know if you're having foot pain and not in shape running three-point line to three-point line or foul line to foul line and getting all the way you know rim running into the paint so um hopefully joel is coming into his own he kind of said as much that he's working his way back into where he should be and i'm optimistic that you know things will get to where they should be with him soon but it's just the uh continued thought that as he goes the team goes so if he's not quite where he should be then the team isn't quite working in the rhythm that they should be and i feel like that's personified itself in some of these losses would you agree noah yeah he's he's their best player so uh this is really significant i do think like there's probably an important distinction he's not actively dealing with serious pain every time he runs up and down the court the impact here is just that he couldn't be on his feet because this did prevent him from that during the offseason and therefore that's the explanation for the conditioning being suboptimal at this stage but the Sixers would not be playing Joel Embiid if he was dealing with like severe foot pain you know early in the regular season I think there's much more prudence than that uh, regarding his health I do think the way they've had to alter their rotations is impactful Doc Rivers went into this season expecting the norm that Joel Embiid can play 11 or 12 minutes to start a game, and it became evident pretty quickly that that wasn't doable, wasn't a smart idea, didn't allow Embiid to maintain his motor throughout the night. So now I think they're doing some trial and error with, okay, for the time being, it's it's going to be six or seven or five even minutes for Joel at the start of the game and start of the third And then what should our rotation look like beyond that? So last night he expanded the rotation, got Shake Milton in there for a few minutes and did say he wants that to be the case moving forward, you know, to to play an extra guy. And perhaps there will be a bit of a quiet tournament, as Brett Brown would say, that plays out uh, with, you know, some of those rotation minutes that now Doc Rivers wants to add to the mix. But I do think it threw some plans into flux for the Sixers when Joel Embiid's conditioning was not what they expected, understandably, because he was, you know, dealing with this painful injury during his offseason. And excuse me, here we are with the Sixers um trying to figure it out, trying to incorporate, you know, other players to um, you know, get the rhythm going with the team. Um, but they have been, you know, horribly outscored outside of last night. Uh, in bench points over these first uh, three games. Um, they're one and three now with the win over the Pacers, but those first three games, they were horribly outscored on the bench. Also, you know, something that Doc probably wouldn't have expected with the way they retooled the bench. Um, you bring up Shake Milton being reincorporated. Um, do you think his emergence has helped with the bench scoring? Um, or are you looking at it like it's mostly uh, them trying to figure out rotations and where people fit and things like that? Because it's kind of one of those when it rains, it pours situations, I would assume, when you're not getting the right, you know, production from your starters, the bench is affected in some way, you know, the players you match with the starters and to the lineup uh, to, you know, sub the players who are sitting on the bench. Like it just, it just all wasn't working the way it should be. Yeah, I I don't think we're at the point any longer where the expectation is Shake Milton will be the second coming of Lou Williams or Jamal Crawford. And he didn't have a large role last night. It was just, I believe, a little over four minutes in the second quarter. But it is interesting because Rivers had initially said he liked the idea of a nine-man rotation because that, that would allow him to stagger his star or top duos the way he wanted to. And now the shifting seems that the thinking seems to have shifted for an 0 and 3 team. You understand not loving the way things were going. And then, as I said, there's also the element of Embiid's minutes had to change and therefore the lineups and the combos and the patterns you like, uh, those are all different as well. I do as I've said before, think Milton is a viable NBA two-way player, and we know the Sixers have prioritized those. To this point, it had been all external guys who'd gotten those opportunities 
now it looks like Shake Milton might have a chance here as well. If he plays uh, effectively over the next week or two, could probably solidify a spot. Um, we all know injuries realistically are going to have to hit at some point. The Sixers have been fortunate, actually, that they haven't had any players miss games. But uh, when that does happen, you imagine the Miltons, Korkmazes, Thibels of the world uh, will have opportunities come their way. I think with the bench overall, some of the scoring disparity is a little ungenerous in the sense that many of those lineups are all about James Harden and he's doing most of the scoring, but yeah, they'd been disappointing overall over the first three games. And last night was a lot more of what the Sixers envisioned. I thought everyone in that mix contributed positively. We saw Montrezl Harrell running the rim, running to the rim, drawing fouls. We saw Daniel house knock down a quick three and uh, I thought looked pretty good on both ends and a little more sure of kind of the basics with where he's supposed to be. Uh, George Niang, of course, the outside marksmanship and some of the other little complementary skills. And Anthony Melton as well uh, was knocking down the three-point shots and uh, looked comfortable, I think, next to Harden and not having as large of a creation burden there. So the bench, uh, definitely a work in progress, both in terms of how they're going to rotate and then also uh, the guys having chemistry with each other. But last night was a positive step. Uh, and was really just all about the ball movement, the unselfishness, and everyone chipping in, uh, which the Sixers love to see. Yeah, there was a moment there last night where uh, Daniel L. House and and D'Anthony Melton were on the same side of the court. Um, and, man, I liked how they looked guarding that wing together, uh, just the read and react, the uh, lateral movement, um, you know, the defensive posture, the head up, uh, the way they were closing out in the shooters. Um, I could see – you know, that being effective for the Sixers, uh, hopefully um, the rotations get figured out soon and, you know, the fit and who should be on the floor with whom uh, works itself out. But um, surprisingly, last night we were treated to something no one has ever seen with Tobias Harris, Mr. Let It Fly, shooting 10 threes in a game, which is his career high. Um, and I was definitely. Um, Upset that more of the shots didn't drop. I thought that his selection was great and maybe a couple of opportunities he could have shot the ball more. But um, that that you, you, he needs to have more credit, I feel like, for his adaptivity to these different roles and, um, you know, changing his style of play a bit to match what the Sixers need. And 10 threes from, and a game from him, I like he's not a volume scorer and he's never going to be a guy – uh, I think he finished with like 18 points, but he's never going to be a, buy, a guy that, you know, is giving you 30 on uh, nights. I mean, he could catch catch fire for sure. And, uh, you know, that he could have made, you know, seven, eight of those threes uh, on, on any given night. But uh, just 10 threes from Tobias Harris, what was there was a certain point where I had to check the box score. And like, how many times has he shot a three-pointer? But did, did you feel like you you were noticing him putting the ball up a lot or did that just something that you caught after the game? Like, Oh, he, he shot 10 threes. Well, I think he put up two on the first possession. So you were, you were clued in early to the mindset. <laughs> two for I, a dollar, man. Yeah. Two for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll have to double check. I thought 11 was the career high. Oh, 11 threes. I believe it was 11. Uh, but I think this was his most since January of 2020. Again, I'll have to double check. I, I could be wrong there, but regardless, it was his most uh, in recent memory for sure. And this is what he said he would do at media day. He said, higher volume of threes, get them off quicker. Don't be worried about the results. And he's backed up those words at least. And it's exactly what Joel Embiid and the Sixers want to see. We've heard Embiid plead time and time again, even last night included, that he wants all his teammates to take the open shots that come their way. Harris is modeling that well thus far. And, I think always the test is if you have a slump, does that continue? So we shall see with right. him if he's able to maintain that level of confidence, that level of willingness to shoot. But I think not all of it's mindset. Some of it too is he was meticulous about looking back at the tape and he's been a little vague when, you know, I've tried to get details on what exactly he tweaked, but you do see 
the quickness of the release looks comfortable. So there's a nice rhythm, regardless of where the pass is delivered, where he's able to flow smoothly into the shot. There are one or two where I thought, hmm, that wasn't a perfect pass, but he did a nice job sort of getting it down or to the side and quickly into a shot pocket. So credit to him for those little adjustments that allow him to do this rather important thing for the Sixers, which is to get off a bunch of threes. And uh, Joel Embiid said he also wants Tyrese Maxey shooting 10 a game as well. So he has high ambitions, uh, but they got off 43, which tied their high from last season. And yeah, if Joel Embiid has his way, I guess they'll be hitting 50 or 60 soon enough. <laughs> um, with, with all that, we've got uh, the spacing that the Sixers are starting to really enjoy uh, with P.J. Tucker out on the floor, stretching and make, keeping the big man honest all the way out to the wing um, because of his threat of making three-point shots. Uh, Tyrese Maxey obviously – has been chucking them up, and it's it was interesting last night to see him on the floor against Tyrese Halliburton, um, another young guard who's you know making a name for himself. Um, you, you feel like Maxi kind of th- does he relish those chances or opportunities to play against those guys? I, I don't I don't know how how he takes that. Yeah, he has certain guys. I think that he looked looks up to or looked up I've seen, to. I've seen him with Emmanuel quickly, obviously the whole Kentucky connection, but I, I'm curious how he might, you know, in a the broader perspective. Yeah. So I, I think firstly players that are a bit older than Halliburton, he gets a kick out of that and savors the matchups. So one memorable one for me last year was uh, the Sixers versus the Raptors. And just talking about how, watch Van Vliet at Wichita State and and he admires you know his savviness and intelligence as a player and thought he was going to be good in the NBA. Drew Holiday is another player he admired growing up and he loves that matchup. So I think there's that part of it for Maxi with the older guys and then I think also just in general when he goes up against a good offensive player he understands the reputation right now is he's below average defensively and he wants to show that that's wrong and we all know he still has work to do but uh, I do think he he likes that when the expectation is we can pick on Maxi defensively and our guy's gonna have his way against him and Maxi wants to show that that's not correct so he does have that competitive edge to him I think just innately last night of course was not his best one from a shooting standpoint started one for nine although he did uh, make a big three in the fourth quarter, kept firing away as Embiid wants to wants him to. And yeah, I think thus far it's been a mixed bag for him overall, like, the, like for the Sixers. But the hope is that as Embiid works his way into shape, as the offense becomes brisker, in large part due to Embiid's better conditioning, that that also is conducive to Maxi's speed being a weapon and him just overall having uh, some stronger offensive nights uh, as the season, you know, continues uh, for the Sixers. Yeah. The Raptors, another Vogue pick for a lot of people as a dark horse in the Eastern conference, a team that might surprise some people. Um, What are you expecting from the Sixers here as they hit the road for this game in Toronto and playing them twice uh, in short order? Um, do you expect this to be um, more of them taking a step forward or do the Raptors present a challenge that the Sixers will maybe have some trouble meeting? I think a big question here is uh, Scotty Barnes missed miss their last game with an ankle sprain, has been out with that. So whether or not he's available, uh, they started Coloco last game, a young big guy instead. So obviously the schematic, Preparation is a lot different for Barnes versus uh, someone else. But I think we know regardless what the Toronto Raptors do, the Sixers have no mysteries about that team's identity. They're going to double Joel Embiid really hard. And I think for the Sixers, it's going to be let's carry over what we did in terms of unselfishness and ball movement and Embiid not caring about the points, but caring about just making the right play, reading the defense. Uh, and being sharp, you know, when Toronto sends all of that help his way. As far as my expectations, yeah, it's, 
I don't have much confidence because we we thought the Sixers <laughs> would be a good basketball team and they have not looked like one thus far. But I think a split probably is uh, reasonable and not especially bold call here for this two game mini mini series the Sixers have. And I think, uh, yeah, right now there's just a lot of unanswered questions with this team. And if I have to make a mini prediction for the mini series, I think that's what I would go with. Hopefully it's not a loss, but a lesson as these guys are trying to bring it together here. And, um, you know, I, I guess it's a little unreasonable for fans to expect this team with, uh, you know, these new influxes of players trying to incorporate them to hit the ground running so successfully. But, um, you know, you kind of buy into some of that um, off-season hype and the, you know, optimism. And, you know, hopefully the Sixers can figure it out here soon um, and, you know, avoid some of the frustration that you've kind of seen, you know, popping up over these three losses, um, particularly when, you know, you're losing the teams that you shouldn't be, like the Spurs, who are clearly, you know, not putting their best product on the floor or expected to be one of the worst teams in the league and you just get out-efforted uh, by them, but hopefully the, the Sixers pick up the intensity and there's no reason to think that they won't, um, you know, but as one of our producers for Sixers pre and post game, uh, Brian Brennan likes to say, uh, the, the other team gets paid too. So um, they're, they're getting paid every two weeks and get a check and they're professionals as well. So um, they're going to bring it and uh, not roll over for the 76ers. But plenty of good vibes to feel in the city of Philadelphia as the Sixers figure it out with the Union, the Phillies, of course, as well as the uh, Eagles back at it. So hopefully you can, um, you know, uh, water down uh, this bitter pill uh, with some of the action that's going on around the city as the Sixers try to figure it out. But we are here every step of the way. Four games in the books. Uh, uh, Noah has a few articles up on the website. Be sure to check it out on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. Anything we didn't get to, Noah, that we uh, need to hit on? I think, think that's pretty good. Yeah, the yeah one of the articles you mentioned, I did did talk a little with Shake Milton, just someone who's been in this sort of position a lot, and I'm really interested how this is going to play out because, as I said, I think of the internal guys, he has the best case for being an actual two-way player who can – help the team win in the playoffs. Uh, so perhaps he, he can seize a spot here, but I thought it was interesting just his perspective on how he, how he approaches this stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I th- think he captured it all well. Um, the vibes I think for this podcast would have been horrific if the Sixers Lord had have mercy. Yeah, so, <laughs> hey, there you uh, They have got to win and they can only go up from the 0 and 3 start one would think. So yeah, I, uh, I saw that, a meme. That's probably yeah, how it is. One of those uh, Spider-Man memes where they're all pointing at each other and it was like the Rockets, the Sixers, the Magic and the Lakers all 0 and 3 mm-hmm. like pointing at each other like uh, uh, uh. but Sixers are off the snide. Hopefully uh, more wins are to come this week as uh, they try to figure this thing out. But uh check out Noah Levick's work on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. Follow him on the social channels at Noah Levick. Uh, I'm D. Palmels, NBCS. I am Ben Barry for our producer extraordinaire. We appreciate you guys listening and watching. As always, jump in those comments. Give us your reviews, thoughts, suggestions, five-star ratings, if you please. Um, But we'll see you next time. Thursday, we'll be coming at you with a podcast in between games. Uh, We will see you then. For Noah, I'm Danny and Ben. This has been the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmu Works.